manner in which that was done was the New York State investigator looked at a database. Amber Costello, the day before her uh, disappearance on September 1st, 2010, met with an, an individual for the purposes of uh, having him pay her money for her services. But she uh, she would involve she involved herself in a ruse where uh, other individuals came into the the house, pretended to be a significant others, confronted individual. Uh, with the purpose of, of making that individual uncomfortable, having him leave without retrieving his money. And that's exactly what happened. So that individual was identified as, as a person who was between 6'4 and 6'6, a large man, thickly built, not necessarily overly muscular, but just a naturally uh, big person with glasses, white and dark hair. Hello and welcome to True Crime Rocket Science, the most authentic voice in true crime. Thursday, July 13th, proved to be an unlucky day for New York architect Rex Hauerman, 59 years old, identified by one witness as a six foot six ogre. Ironically, this was not only one of the best clues in the case, but also part of the source code for the killer's motive. An arrest in the Gilgo Beach murders more than a decade in the making. The case has long remained a mystery. After a string of killings in 2010, this is the man police have taken into custody. Howerman so far has been linked to three victims, but there may be as many as 18. In images published by the New York Post and Fox News, the towering shaggy head architecture boss a family man, a married father of two, appears dazed and confused. When asked if the alleged killer was surprised when placed under arrest, Suffolk County District Attorney Raymond Tierney responded, I would say he was. He wasn't the only one, and the reason for that was they kept this investigation secret. But we are beginning to learn more about him and his arrest that has shocked the Long Island community. His lawyer said yesterday that uh, Howerman was sobbing and blubbering. He said, I did not do this. That was on Friday. In court, Howerman was silent and stone-faced during his arraignment. That's almost already three different faces to this alleged killer. The dazed and confused, the indignant, and then the silent and stone-faced appearance during his arraignment. And that's where we are right now. Just hours ago, Howerman was charged with three counts of first-degree murder. Howerman has pleaded not guilty. In this analysis, I want to focus very briefly on how Howerman was tracked down. How was a case that had gone cold for more than a decade brought back on track, ultimately leading to Thursday's outcome? On the streets of Massapequa Park, Long Island, his dramatic arrest in Midtown Manhattan outside his architectural office on Fifth Avenue, not far from where an infamous slice of pizza was recovered from a garbage can. But before we get to the rest of this episode, if you're new to this channel, uh, my name is Nick van der Leek. I'm a author of numerous true crime books. I've also written books on mass shooters and incels. If you're enjoying this episode, please like, share, leave a comment. You can also hit the thanks button and let's get started. Now, if you're new to this channel, or even if you're not, you may not be aware that I actually have a policy against covering cases involving gratuitous violence, and that applies in particular to serial killers. I'll put some more details regarding that in the description of this video. I'm making an exception in this case because of the many requests that I've received from you guys, and also I'm partial to New York since I was there just a few weeks ago, and the suspect worked in Midtown Manhattan, which is where I stayed when I was in New York. So, in a nutshell, how did they catch him? Well, in a word, analysis. Rex Yerman was identified for the first time. And the ma manner in which that was done was the New York State investigator looked at a database. Very graceful. No, but very efficient. It is or it can be a very efficient way to catch a killer. You need to break down large sets of data. How good are you at it? How effective are you at seeing patterns in the noise? So if the how is analysis, the next question is what? Analyze what? Answer phone data. Do you see it still comes down to good old-fashioned police work, although today's good old-fashioned police work is a little more sophisticated, more digital, I guess, than yesterday's. 
So you want to be good with analytics, working systematically, analyzing data, identifying patterns, and then narrowing it all down. Simple, but not easy. But this is how the Suffolk County Police Commissioner got the ball rolling. So that is the how in a nutshell. But in terms of the overall story, where did it start? Well, it started around the 10-year anniversary of an unsolved case involving multiple victims. And an anniversary like that is as good a time to restart an investigation as any. And at first, it was slow going. In February 2022, about 11 to 12 years after the murders, the Suffolk County Police Commissioner Rodney Harrison called the first meeting of a task force. Six weeks later, and you heard him say that at the beginning, in mid-March 2022, Rex Howellman's name came up for the first time. Not bad if you think about it. Basically, after just six weeks of investigating an 11 or 12-year-old cold case, you already have a hold of a credible suspect. According to CNN, quote, investigators have gone backward through phone records collected from both Midtown Manhattan as well as the Massapequa Park area, two areas where a burner phone used by the alleged killer were detected. That's according to court documents. And so it was a simple process trying to figure, trying to configure two phones, trying to sync them up, two numbers moving through the urban fabric between Manhattan and Long Island in tandem. As I say, a simple strategy, but not so easy to do in practice. According to the article, quote, authorities then narrowed records collected by cell towers to thousands, then down to hundreds, and finally down to a handful of people who could match a suspect. Well, match him in what way? Well, you heard that as well. A particular idiosyncratic description. Authorities worked to focus on people who lived in the area of the cell tower who matched a physical description given by a witness who had seen the suspected killer, end quote. What was that description again? Well, a six foot six ogre. Well, how many people in your neighborhood matched that description? I'd wager not many. At the beginning of this episode, I teased this idea that the appearance of the perpetrator is not only how they caught him, but also part of the psychology, part of the why, how, how though, how is how this person looked part of why he committed this crime, well, allegedly. Another dimension to it was they learned that he had often driven a green pickup registered to his brother, but then they needed more circumstantial evidence than that, and that was the the boots-to-the-ground police work. So if we pull out, to some extent, out of the trees and we try and look at the general woods of this case, what are we talking about? Are we talking about a stranger among us? Well, it's a popular myth that there is something special about serial killers. They're either incredibly clever or their psychopathy somehow makes them smarter than the average person. Do you think that is true in this case? Scott Bonn, an assistant professor of sociology at Drew University in Madison, New Jersey, told the Times that this is someone who can walk into a room and seem like your average Joe. Is that a fair assessment, would you say? I think there's some truth in that, but also some distortion in that statement. The true part is that Howerman perceived himself to be an average Joe, more average than he wanted to be, less average than society perceived him to be. But I wouldn't describe an architect working in Midtown Manhattan as average. What is true about this statement is that serial killers, like all of us, have a dark side, that they can successfully hide away for years, decades, while assuming a normal life as loving husbands and fathers. But that's not so very different from us. All of us are capable of hiding sides to ourselves for a long time as well. Others may regard serial killers as extremely evil and thus mind-numbingly frightening. And so there's this interesting quote where police have described him as a demon who walks amongst us, a predator who ruins families. And those are actually the words of Suffolk County Police Chief Rodney Harrison. Well, he wasn't some kind of alien to Howerman's wife and children. He wasn't some kind of strange, otherworldly predator to his colleagues, not even to his former classmates. And we'll get to them in a moment. What this shows isn't how evil or psychopathic or terrifying a particular serial killer is. 
It shows instead how criminality can exist in a community, even in a family, without a community knowing about it. And so what is missing in that? How can a community figure out that there's a serial killer in their midst? Well, with a bit of critical thinking. And that then brings us to my speciality, which is criminal psychology. Now, whenever one deals with gratuitous crime, that's to say crime that is particularly cruel, thoughtless, heartless, also violent and heinous, one must be careful to separate it from other crimes and criminals. In the Ido student's case, the extremeness of the crime matches the extreme psychology of the individual. The, the question is how? In that case, it was loneliness. You might say, how can a benign thing like loneliness lead to something so extreme? But loneliness can be extreme and perceived as excruciating in a super social setting like college. And so what we are dealing with here and with all serial killers is an extreme psychology, an extreme level of sadism. And we have an extreme level of sadism. You're also going to have a corresponding extreme level of anality. In terms of this extreme psychology, how has it been deformed or twisted? Well, it's through a process and over a period of time. So how does this process play out in practice? And specifically, in terms of this specific individual, how does it actually practically play out? And that raises another question. Are serial killers born or made? Is it nature or nurture? Well, it's clearly a bit of both. But people may be surprised to know just how much nurturing is involved. Nurturing, by the way, is that component that comes from society. Some nurturing clearly flows from one's nature as well. Certain natural appetites can be nurtured until they become unnatural, such as excessive consumption of pornography. Now, when investigators searched Howman's computer, what did they find? Well, a disturbing internet search history, including 200 searches aimed at learning about the status of the investigation. That's also kind of a, an extreme amount of interest in a particular case, wouldn't you say? Of course, his internet searches also included queries for a particular kind of online content that I think can best be described as depraved and also sadistic. And that brings us to victimology. Most of the known victims in this case were sex workers who advertised on Craigslist. It's clear the killer had no connection to any of the victims. He simply had a raving, rampant and extremely deviant appetite that had gone from an addiction to a compulsion. And each crime was an attempt to satisfy these feelings and impulses. Well, what feelings and impulses in particular? The perpetrator wasn't seeking any kind of personal connection, but rather wanted a release for his violent fantasies. And so he saw sex workers as an easy way to procure, that's another word for lure, uh, and also easily disposable. In other words, his interests were gratuitous. According to The Sun, quote, American Express records that were obtained from a subpoena indicated that Howerman allegedly made several Google Pay payments for a Tinder account. The account was made using the name Andrew Roberts, according to the document. Andrew is Howerman's middle name. The email address used for the Tinder profile was allegedly used under the name John Springfield and had a zip code from Astoria, Queens in New York City. A search warrant was obtained to investigate the email address, which revealed several selfies that appeared to have been taken by Howerman himself. The photos were allegedly sent to people in hopes of soliciting and arranging hookups, which investigators believe links Howerman to the John Springfield email address and Tinder profile. You also have this strange situation where you have this alter ego, this fake name, fake persona, engaging online with other fake names and personas from these sex workers. But when you think about serial killers, it tends to have this really powerful allure about it that there's something almost out of this world, you know, an out of this world intelligence taking place. But when you know the details, there's nothing very James Moriarty going on here. If anything, it's quite a lazy, clumsy way of committing crimes because you're taking selfies distributing them, sending them out into the other, and leaving digital breadcrumbs everywhere. 
Using a burner phone was one way to complicate the track and trace process. And that then brings us to the evidence trail. Mirroring the digital evidence trail, there's also a DNA trail. We won't go into much of that detail here. But that is what you tend to leave in murders which have an expressly sexual motive. And as mentioned, witnesses had also seen the suspect and his vehicle. There were also credit card bills that formed part of the uh, database that they had to sort of figure out. Incredibly, some of the DNA found on the victim's bodies was from Howerman's wife, who police discovered was often out of town when the crimes were committed. This was likely transfer DNA. For me, the most interesting aspect of serial killers are the psychological seeds. As mentioned earlier, people tend to regard serial killers with unrealistic awe. In reality, serial killers are very real products of society. If they are monsters, well then we, collectively, are the monster's mother. Who are you? I'm the monster's mother. What serial killers do is they reveal the most vacuous elements in ourselves and our society to us, despite the efforts to imagine them as alien monsters or demons that are nothing like us. And so where did Howman's sexual animosity potentially take root? According to The Sun, quote, former classmates of Howman's at Byrne High School in Massapequa, New York, they reacted in a voice of collective shock. Oh, how did this happen? Maureen Holpert, who was in the same graduating class as Howerman in 1981, she told the U.S. Sun that she never thought the quiet, mild-mannered and awkward teen she remembered from all those years ago would ever be capable of allegedly committing such horrific acts. I don't know. So often we hear about perpetrators that are all of those things. Going back to the article, she said she was like, no way, I couldn't believe it. She said, on Friday, there was this sort of eerie moment where she learned of Howerman's arrest. And she said, it gives me such an eerie, creepy feeling because he always seemed just like a very quiet, unassuming, and just a little bit of a nerdy guy. But she said, people picked on him quite a lot. She said, I didn't like to see him being bullied. So I was nice to him and kind to him. I would say hi, and he'd smile to me in the hallways and leave notes in my locker. But the feeling wasn't mutual. Holpert said that Howman was mostly picked on by boys who would hurl insults at him as he walked through the school hallways. Why do you think that was? Well, because he didn't look like them, because he was this oversized individual. Holpert offered Howerman reassurance, but he mistook her kindness for romantic interest. So you can see how this attitude to woman is a lifelong issue for this person. In other words, he struggled to assert himself sexually from an early age and was, was simultaneously emasculated and humiliated in his efforts to do that. And these left scars during high school, which appeared to have been lifelong. It seems when Howerman entered his 40s, that is when they manif manifested with a vengeance. I'm not going to take it further than that, but I have to say I'd be interested to know more about Howerman's family dynamics going back to his parents and childhood. If you'd like me to continue analysis on this case, let me know in the comments. Thank you for listening, and I'll see you guys next time.